many people excited to talk and to be with one another. And um, I'm glad we have a moment to get started. I want to welcome each of you. We have so many family and friends and alumni here in this room. Um, and it is so fun to see our graduates who've gone on to do uh, remarkable things. We're so proud of you. And to have so many of our um, legacy alumni in the room as well. And we're looking forward to this weekend. This is uh, a weekend co-sponsored by the UNC Physicians Network. And I want to be sure to thank them and their recruiters who've come here. Many of our graduates have gone on to join the UNC Physicians Network. And we're thrilled to partner with them in this event. So we're here for the alumni reunion and the Henley Lecture. And uh, I want to be sure to point out that it's through the generous donations of you in this room, of our family, friends, and alumni that allow us to make an impact as the leading department of family medicine, transforming care and growing leaders to improve health. Part of the reason we're here today is due to the legacy of Senator John Henley, who was a pharmacist in Hope, Hope Mills, North Carolina. Senator Henley was acutely aware of the difficulty that many of his patients had to accessing uh, primary care. And uh, before I tell you more about him, I want to be sure to give a special welcome to his son, Doug Henley, who is a graduate of the UNC School of Medicine and our residency program. He is now the executive vice president for and CEO of the American Academy of Family Medicine. Doug has two brothers, both UNC alumni who couldn't be with us, but Doug, would you stand and be recognized? <laughs> there are many people in this room that I'd also like to recognize, and we'd be here all day, but I also want to recognize um, a very important member of our department's history, Dr. Ed Shahidi who uh, was a former chair here at UNC, very instrumental in the beginnings and the founding of this department. <laughs> so back to Senator Henley, he was instrumental in the formation of UNC Family Medicine, and it is fitting that his family gave this endowment and lectureship in his name to be focused on family medicine leadership. Senator Henley opened the pharmacy in Hope Mills, North Carolina in 1946. He witnessed patients entering the hospital across the street, knowing that they were going in for treatments that should have been prevented. And he would see patients come into his pharmacy for expensive medications that they didn't need. And so with the spirit of this is something that should be done, it should be done, he used his influence of the North Carolina legislature to create and initially fund the UNC Department of Family Medicine in 1969. And then he went on throughout his career, and you can read about him in the program, but he went on to influence the creation of the East Carolina School of Medicine, the Brody School of Medicine. So with all of that and his legacy and leadership, it is also fitting that we have one of our discipline's great leaders here with us to inspire us toward the future of family medicine leadership. So I get the honor of introducing Dr. Warren Newton. <laughs> <laughs> Many people in this room, everyone in this room, I, I can to say confidently has been positively influenced by Dr. Newton and his leadership. How many people here, and there'll be many people who meet multiple categories, but how many people here have been influenced um, more recently in his work with North Carolina AHEC? People here from AHEC, yes. Okay, and how many have been influenced in career development in their chapters as faculty or staff or in growing? I don't think everybody's going to raise their hand on that one. How many as fellows or residents or medical students were influenced by the teaching of Dr. Newton? Yes, almost everyone. Um, and, and there are many other categories that we could say. He has too many accolades to count. Everyone in this room knows that. Um, so I will just summarize to say that Dr. Newton was the chair of UNC Family Medicine in this department for 17 years. He was my attending when I was a medical student um, and very influential as a mentor to me. He was vice dean for education for the medical school, leading the medical school through an LCME site visitation and accreditation. 
who is Vice Dean and Director of North Carolina AHEC, and he is currently moving to Lexington, Kentucky to serve as President and CEO of the American Board of Family Medicine. Dr. Newton, as you know, is a visionary. He is an inspirational leader, an excellent mentor, but above all, he's a good man who uses his talents consistently to better the world around him. So with that, I'm delighted to welcome you to the podium. I knew Chrissy was special because, uh, and I'm sorry, I will only do this a few times during that session. I was on call, I was an inpatient attending, she was an AI, um, and she had a night in which there were eight rule out MIs admitted, <laughs> and she kept them all straight. <laughs> Remarkable, and thank you so much uh, for that very generous uh, welcome. Okay. Great, and uh, Christy introduced John Henley. I've met him once um, in my life, and I think you know this is a matter of life lives and lessons learned. I think one of the lessons that I've learned on reflecting about uh, uh, John Henley um, is the importance of doing what you think is right, <laughs> despite the blowback. And that was true for the department here. That was true in spades with uh, the Brody School of Medicine and other places. And I think in this age of lots of things going on and really shifting sands, understanding what's right to do and doing what's right is a really important lesson for me as I move forward. Um, the Henley Lectureship, the goal of the Henley Lectureship is to talk about leadership. And what I'm gonna try to make the case is that our leadership comes from professionalism. And what I'll try to focus on is uh, what does it mean uh, for family physicians? Uh, and I think uh, all physicians and all health practitioners um, in April, 2018. My overall objective, obviously the biggest thing is to thank everybody in the room from uh, the, uh, the nurses I work with. Thank you, Janice. Uh, and others uh, from the students and medical students and residents that I've worked with over the years in, in Fowler and many people from the institution as well. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, and, and the many people in AHEC and others who actually helped with this presentation. Um, but in terms of the content, what I'd like to do is to sort of frame, go in three parts. That is, what's the scene from the perspective of leadership and professionalism right now? to talk about professionalism related to leadership. And here I'm gonna be talking about uh, our thinking as we put in place a curriculum on professionalism for the medical students here. And then finally, to talk about lessons learned. Uh, and that's fully taking advantage of the fact that I've got a captive audience and can reflect on 33 years here at UNC. So I, um, I, I think if you wanna go straight to the end, I think the big points are we are living in turbulent times with great risks and even greater opportunity. That our sense of professionalism is foundational to everything we do going forward. And that leadership actually comes out of that professionalism and our commitments to, to patients, our commitments to each other and our commitments to society. Um, some caveats, whenever you begin talking about what behavior physicians or family physicians or clinicians should do, you're always acutely aware of the gap between what you ought to be doing and what you actually are doing. And I apologize in advance <laughs> for that. I think the other piece, the second piece is that uh, it's a, it's a 10,000 foot perspective. Um, you know, so there's a vast and rich literature on professionalism, it's rise and fall and rise again, as well as many aspects of that. I am just focusing on parts of it um, and glad to have other kinds of questions. And then finally, uh, I, really the point of all this is dialogue. So 
Um, this times out in about 33, 34 minutes, um, at least without an audience and without being nervous. So I will tell you. Um, so, but I hope that there will be a nice amount of time uh, for discussion and questions. And there's a lot of wisdom in the room uh, as we go forward. So let me go through the first element of this. Um, and many of you have heard me say something like this, but it's very clear that we're living through a time not just of usual change, but transformational change. I think it's fair to say that in no time since I started seeing patients in the Family Medicine Center in 1984, that there's been no change, no time in which the, the pace and amplitude of change is uh, as great as it is now. And I think it's important to understand sort of how it fits in and, and, and some for instances. Uh, in my AIC role, I work with lots of hospital CEOs. I've probably interviewed 60 or 70 in the last three years, uh, as well as many C-suite people. The, the consolidation in healthcare is huge. So we've gone in North Carolina from something like 130, these things are a little bit difficult to help, to something like 12 or 13 hospital systems in a number of years, three or four. It's blindingly quick. It's happening all over the country, maybe a little bit more advanced here than other places. Um, and it has huge implications on everything. The second point is physicians and employment. So the, the, the magic time, the magic turnover is somewhere to like 2005, 2006, in which the majority of physicians became employed. Now that number in North Carolina is 80 to 90 percent. Actually, fewer family physicians are employed. Uh, the best data we have for North Carolina, about 70 percent are employed. And uh, many of those are uh, in practices, but an increasing, a large and increasing numbers are employed by clinically integrated networks. Uh, this is something different on the sun. It should change everything we do and is changing everything we do, but I don't think we've paid enough attention to it. Um, I'll point, by the way, is when you have changes like this, there's huge shifts in leadership. Uh, when I started in AHEC uh, four, almost five years ago, uh, we've had almost complete turnover of all the CEOs in the state, with two exceptions. Ron Paulus at Mission, who's about to go, given the purchase of Mission, uh, uh, and uh, Bill, who will be retiring, you know, one of these decades or something like that. Uh, so what I'd underscore is that the market changes are, are just beginning. So I believe there's a good chance that by the end of this month, the Medicaid reform that was passed by the legislature uh, several years ago will actually be approved by CMS and will start the, the process. Um, that may be optimistic, but it's sometime this spring. Um, that likewise with uh, Pat Conway from CMS becoming the head of Blue Cross Blue Shield, we'll see, uh, I think, much more towards pay for value and experimentation in Blue Cross Blue Shield, which as all of you know, is three quarters or more of the commercial market. And then there's all these weird things. You know, what does it mean when Walmart and Humana get together, that Amazon and Berkshire Hathaway of all people, and, and, and we thought CVS and Aetna wasn't significant. We're seeing this huge shift. When we started, I thought, oh, you know, it's gonna be two or three years and then it'll go down, but it, it's not stopping, folks. So that's the first point I make. The second question is, all right, where do family physicians and I think other, uh, looking at Jerry Joins, other, uh, others in the environment, where do we fit in? And I, and I think in many ways, you know, we're the, um, we are both the boundary spanners. Our, our patients work everywhere. We, we follow patients and our patients go everywhere and we talk with them and we get a sense of that. We're also the canary in the coal mine. That is, as systems break down or as systems change, we feel it whether it be in continuity, in uh, <coughs> um, my favorite, I don't know about you, is this huge increase in price of generics. So my record so far is a month's worth of hydroxyzine, which were, they were charging the patient uh, $400 um, uh, for something that's been generic for 50 years. Um, it's crazy. And with it comes uh, the unbundling of the core of primary care, that is, uh, I think we all believe in Barbara Starling's work and says, look, the societies that do better in terms of cost and quality have a robust primary care function. 
That is first contact care, that is coordination of care, that is whole person care and broad care. Um, there is the unbundling of that at this stage. And then I think one of the symptoms is burnout and resilience. Um, so uh, ABFM data now, it looks like uh, is pretty, pretty impressive that if you're an employed physician, you're more likely to be burned out. Uh, and uh, we also see dramatic shifts in the, in the change in scope of practice. I've mentioned to some of you that over about a three year period, about 8,000 family physicians stopped seeing children. That's a huge amount of <coughs> rapidly quickly. And I was just looking at data. We, we do a, a survey, we meaning the Board of Family Medicine, does a survey of residents three years out. And the, um, what we, we know for the first time is that 20% of residents, and this is a national sample, um, are not practicing with a continuity practice, uh, which is a significant shift as we go. And some of it is what, what medicine has already seen, which is when you pay people 30, 50 times uh, percent as much uh, uh, for hospital care as others, then, then you go in that direction. But there's big changes in family medicine. And then finally, and I'm delighted to see you in the room, Julie, because a lot of this comes out of our work in curriculum together. Uh, a, a short history of professionalism itself is changing. So I think we often in family medicine uh, harken back to what's been called nostalgic pro 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 uh, professionalism. It's the horse and buggy. It's the general practice doctor who would go to house visits um, who would see people no matter what they <laughs> could pay. Uh, it's the Marcus Welby uh, image. In the, in the 60s, there began to be a radical critique. It was a kind of a Marxist critique of this, of privilege. And they said, you know, and Boys in White is a classic book, and among other things, they focused on youth medical students. And they made, uh, they emphasized that, you know, they're all boys, they're men, they're all white, um, and they're tremendously privileged. And according to that analysis, professionalism means nothing. It is just the rationalization that uh, an elite class has for doing what they're doing. Okay. And this is one book, there's a series of books, and the dominant narrative academically is professionalism is old, it doesn't mean anything more. What that translated to uh, particularly in the NHS and in Canada to some extent, is that if you just set up the rules right, if you, in the United States, if you alter incentives, you don't really need professionalism. It doesn't really matter what those doctors do and want to do. The only problem with that is it doesn't work, is that as uh, a series of Western governments have tried that, regulation actually doesn't work. And many of these authors, including these authors in the 90s, began to say, you know, it's not working. We've got to go back to that. I mean, we're wrong in fundamental ways back in the 60s. And to their credit, they said that in print. And one of the best documents for this is something that the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation came up with in the early, in the early 2000s, saying, um, <clears throat> in fact, professionalism is important and we need to move forward, we need to embrace it. And something like 200 organizations have signed on with this, it was a, a big push. That's sort of where we are right now, um, just to, to set the suit. And what I'd like to underscore is that uh, it is, this is a time of both challenge and opportunity. Um, I think we're all aware of the challenges and burnout rates are huge and the problems of numbers of, of patients and revenue and all those sorts of things. They, we are beset with challenges, but there's also a real opportunity and I wanna underscore that moving forward. And um, a nice compendium of data for me is the National Research Council. This was actually about four years ago. Um, but the opportunity is what we can do better. <laughs> what we can do better in the United States, what we can do better as a healthcare system. And I'll just uh, walk you through a little bit of this. Um, this is a, a best data, big data approach in which they compare the United States to many other countries in terms of outcomes. And it's a variety of outcomes, it's a variety of diseases, but I'm gonna highlight a couple of those things. Um, with that top left chart, 
basically, the United States is being compared to other, uh, usually Western, but also Japan, countries with similar socioeconomic status. The red dot is the United States. Those two charts are uh, ability to survive to the age of 50. And I've chosen these arbitrarily. As you can see in 1980, uh, we were comfortably in the bottom third of that international comparison set. The top chart is men. And you can see we've comfortably gone to last in the world in terms of life expectancy, okay? That's sobering enough, but then if you look below here, this is women and the ability to survive until the age of 50 of women. And you say, all right, we started at about the same time and place in 1980, and look what's happened to that curve. We're not at the bottom. We've, we've, we have improved, but we've fallen off the curve compared <laughs> to resources. And this is with um, a, a country that is spending twice as much on healthcare as anybody else. And for me, that's sobering. And then you say, well, is it any particular disease? Is it any particular age? And the answer is it's all of them. It's diffuse. So as an example, in the, the, the mark, we, this is infant uh, mortality, uh, or rather it's a uh, proportion of very low birth weights. And uh, once again, we are put together with our uh, sub-Saharan colleagues as in worst in the world. Um, I think most of us don't think of ourselves this way. Um, and then if it's a uh, chronic disease, that's the incidence of diabetes. Thank goodness for Spain. Uh, by the way, I'm from Mississippi. North Carolina for many years could say, thank goodness for Mississippi. So, um, um, the point is this represents an opportunity of what we can begin to do um, with, uh, with, with leadership. So let me turn over to the second part of my talk, which is, all right, what are the key features of professionals moving forward? Um, and as a vice dean of education, and I have a lot of empathy for the, for the role that, uh, that Julie is playing, we began to say we need, partly persuaded by the arguments I just said, we need to begin to look at professionalism. And then you immediately get in the question of, well, what is it and how do you teach it? And I remember, um, students always give you feedback what you want to try, uh, which is one of the nice things about students. And what, what this woman said is that professionalism is the word your generation uses when you don't like what my generation is doing, um, sort of going forward. She's now just finished, just at the end of a surgery residency. Um, um, as a first step, it led us to a definitional issue and uh, asking the question, for me, asking the question, how is a doctor different from a doormat? Some of you may know that one of my money jobs when I was in college was working as a doorman in Chicago. So what that translates to is you work in a building for two weeks at a time, you come in to cover vacation from a doormat, you wear a little suit, uh, you open doors for people, um, it's clearly, there's a, a very, there's a, a set of knowledge. You have, you're trying to help people. Um, there are rules and there's an ethical side to this. I, I remember one time on a Friday night, I was, you know, what do you do when a 58 year old man brings in a nine year old uh, uh, male child and takes them up to their room? <laughs> Or when a woman comes in uh, and says, you know, I'd sort of like help with my groceries and being put to bed at two in the morning. So there are ethical issues for dormant. Um, by the way, I decided that um, as, as a resident, there was a woman that I was interested in uh, and, and going, taking out for a date. And I thought it was unethical for me to invite her as a doorman to go out on a date. Because that, you know, that would be mixing um, inappropriate <laughs> boundaries. <laughs> but what is it about doctors? What is different? And, and this is just putting into words what all of you are working with. But clearly, there's a complex body of knowledge. That's why all the residents are here and so on. It's clearly in service of others. Um, and there's a profession component. A profession component. That is, we commit publicly to being competent, uh, to altruism, and to the promotion of culture. 
Um, but a key part of professionalism is what might be called a social contract. So the deal is this, and I think it's, I'm gonna mention it with respect to doctors, but it's true for other professions. We give you, society says to doctors, we give you a monopoly on your work. We give you um, control over the use of that work and a lot of autonomy day to day. Um, we give you the privilege of self-regulation. In return, however, we have very important things that we want you to do that have to do with serving society and, and that. And that is the social contract. And what I'm gonna argue is that that's a key part of what we mean by leadership moving forward. But all that is uh, fine words. How do you actually put together a curriculum about this? Um, behaviors matter. And so you end up saying, uh, you have endless discussions about what exactly is professional dress. Um, I, my, my heart goes out to my female colleagues who have no rules and therefore it's a lot more difficult issue. Um, I am amused by the emphasis on white coats. Uh, twice I've been asked to give a white coat address here. As, as many of you know, the Humanism Gold, uh, Gold Humanism Society has wanted to encourage every medical school in the United States to celebrate the first white coat. And I'm saying, all right, what does that mean in family medicine where maybe half of the people wear coats? And what does it really mean in pediatrics and psychiatry where maybe 10% of them wear white coats when they're doing? What do white coats mean? It's clearly significant uh, sim symbolically. <clears throat> the second thing is timeliness. That is, if you're a medical student, you don't show up at time when the, uh, on time when the student gets there, that's important. Um, and then kind of more fundamentally, if you're working particularly on awards, but if you say you're gonna do something, actually doing it. All those behaviors matter. And I would also say that uh, there's other aspects of appearance and I'm grateful and I'm thinking about, I don't know where Adam is sitting, but uh, Adam and uh, um, uh, John, what, when we work outside of medicine, critical to our value is being uh, perceived as uh, without conflict of interest, that we do what is right for our patients. This particular article uh, was a debate we had about whether pharmaceutical companies should support lunches for residents. Um, and interestingly, with residents included, the votes were 12 to seven, yes, after the debate uh, was 12 to 11. So we got close with the debate. But this is an issue that's actually codified in rules now uh, from, from the government. <laughs> but it's more than just behaviors, and it has to do with uh, the learning environment. And I think one of the things that we wrestled with in, uh, in, as we began to be a look at our, our data is that uh, really against our expectations, UNC medical students reported significantly more mistreatment than the average medical student in the, in the United States. And that didn't fit our notion of what a kinder general medical school would work. Now, I'm happy to say that we've actually done much better and we're, we're, we're about half the, actually the national average keeps on going up. So, um, but we've done well with that. But the question is, all right, what do we mean by learning environment? It's not sex for grades. It's not that sort of thing. But a part of it is uh, how we interact with patients. And what was really interesting is giving students voice to what they saw. Some of the best observers are students and residents. And so this is a comment from a, another <coughs> student. There are patients, and we ask them a question every year, what are, what are case, what's the case which has most influenced your development as a clinician? And this woman said, there are patients that residents and attendings make fun of in unprofessional ways. There is often judgment about whether we have, they've had too many kids, shouldn't have kids, about their social situation, and about whether they can afford kids, and most often that they are large. And I think what that resident was, uh, that medical student was trying to focus on is uh, fundamentally, how do, we, how do we engage with our students and our learner? And the, and, and the bottom line is respect. You know, it's respect that's a portal of empathy for patients. 
It is the foundation of teamwork you, uh, for interprofessional care. Unless you respect your nurses, pharmacists, MOAs, and others, there will be no teamwork. Um, and then finally, it's a condition for learning from others, which is, all right, everybody has something that they contribute to you. So it's it, the first thing that I'm going to focus on as a, as a foundation for leadership is respect. The second is making it better. Uh, my life has been changed by this couple of books uh, from the Institute of Medicine. And actually, until two or three years ago, was by far the best selling uh, or most downloaded uh, publication of the Institute of Medicine. What they argued was that there was, in fact, a great deal of error in medicine, uh, that it was not because doctors and nurses were evil people, but because there were inadequate systems. <clears throat> Um, and that's the crossing of the cat, uh, quality chasm. I think a key part of our sense of professionalism is making it better. And that's the driver uh, of learning more so that we can make it better. That means actually uh, taking care of things, changing what we do therapeutically, what we do diagnostically, but also improving systems and improving culture. Um, and I think a key part of this is that each of us has to do it at our own level. This is not something only for people who are executive directors of the AAFP, uh, for example. Um, you know, this is a, an abstract that uh, many of you in the room participated in from our collaborative of residencies. This is 10 family medicine residencies in South Carolina and North Carolina working together, sharing best practices and providing data. We were able to drop the hospitalizations for CHF uh, by almost 40% uh, sort of over that period of time. But, but a lot of leadership isn't that kind of big stuff. Um, it is what each of us does when you take care of patients day by day. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I, one of my first clinical positions was in the health department in Randolph County, where uh, I was the maternity director in that, in that setting. Uh, what I observed, and it was very, very frustrating, is that the, the, the screening urine cultures were almost always contaminated, that is a 90% contamination, something like that. And the question is, how can you make it better? And we changed the way in which they were being collected, and we got down to zero over about a two-year period. That's a small example, but it's also the kind of example that every family physician um, resident medical student can do. Um, so it's at our own level. And then the third part is advocacy. And I was um, saying, you know, uh, there's many people in our department who played a major role. And then I began, as we're looking at this morning, there's a lot of other people. I mean, Adam initially because of his tiresome uh, intervening at a lot of different levels, which is to uh, smoking and gun violence. Uh, Evan who is now championing uh, an intervention for incarcerated, incarcerated people to reduce the rate of death. And Martha, who has been very active in many areas around making a birth safer, not only in the United States, but then I thought, well, what about Bayot? You know, Bayot has played a major role nationally in one of the best changes in medical education in the last five years, which is changing the CMS rules. Uh, along with many people, including Bill Roper and, and others in STFM. Um, what about, what about, what about? There's a lot of people in the room. This is something that's bred into this department. I'm looking at, and at DeBard and, and her long and wonderful leadership with CCNC. There's many others in the room. Um, I'd also say in the spirit of what can we learn, is that I think we in family medicine can learn a lot from pediatrics. Now, the American Board of Pediatrics is in Chapel Hill. Uh, it has one of the most progressive leaders, I think, in the, the board community, David Nichols. And uh, pediatrics has made a part of their residency, every residency in the United States, the training in advocacy. It's part of their definition of professionalism and part of what their residencies are responsible for. Now, I know after Wild Acres, we've begun to do that in our, in our residency here, but um, we can do more moving forward. Um, so let me raise the question, what happens if we don't? What happens if we don't fulfill our social contract? 
Um, and for me, the governing case is um, the Bristol Heart Scandal, which um, some of you may not be aware of, but there's a powerful lesson about this. The story is this. In the late 90s, in Bristol, in the Bristol Trust in the UK, there was a unit that did um, child cardiovascular surgery. And for many years, their mortality rate with a variety of, of operations was roughly double the national benchmarks. Um, the doctors didn't do anything about it. The review committee that was established by doctors to review quality of care didn't do anything about it. Several whistleblowers went to that committee and said, do you realize what's going on from parents, from other doctors, from nurses and say, what's happening here? And that review committee did nothing about it <coughs> until parliament caught up. In a series of interventions, they said, you doctors have failed in your social responsibility. We're gonna take away supervision of quality of care from you. So they put in place a very different system in which doctors are at the table, but not driving. This is what happens when we don't do what society thinks we need to do according to what's written. So I'd ask you, what are our crystals gonna be? And what are they right now? Um, to me, opiates is already a good example of it. With the best of intentions, we treated chronic pain for a long period of time. We rationalized it. We blinded ourselves to the notion that there are actually serious side effects of this. We didn't actually look at outcomes of that. Um, and it has gotten so bad that in every legislature in this country, they've taken over control of opiate prescription in many different ways. This is an example of us not doing our job and wondering whether or not we can improve care. I think there's others that are out there. Uh, every patient I talk to, every employer I talk to, uh, every payer I talk to, every legislator I talk to is worried about the cost of care. But as I work through all of the boards, through all of, almost all of the specialty societies, um, nobody is talking about cost of care. There's a few that talk about value because value allows them to, to uh, um, uh, fund very expensive uh, patients that improve quality of care. But should we not be, this is what everybody in society thinks is important and we're not dealing with it. The effect of consolidation is actually increased costs in North Carolina and other places. <laughs> And then what about patient experience of care? I'm, um, I'm thankful for Anne, to my colleague Anne, who's pointed this out over the years, is that if you are a patient in our ambulatory care setting, it's a very complex and frightening situation. Patients are like pinballs that go around the system. And it's made even worse by the fact that at every point we're changing how much things cost. We're changing where you can go. And I think the, the family physicians, we all are aware of the prior approval process. Is that a Bristol until we stand up and do something about it? So then let me, what my argument is that those things are key for professional. So let me do the, the third segment here around uh, what are the lessons I've learned sort of as a leader, as a family physician in a leadership role in a number of different places? And, um, I think the first issue and the foundational issue is basic integrity and basic relationships. It's no accident that every job I've had, I have started out by saying from uh, residency director to chair to vice dean, to uh, now ABFM is to begin going and meeting people. Everything depends on your relationships and that is only part of what you can do electronically. But it also depends on whether or not you have integrity. That is, do you say what you're gonna do? And that, that might be a little bit of a duh, of course, but as I work in an environment, one of the things I've had to learn uh, about is people looking me at the face and lying frankly. I often think that we coming out of this department, this school, this profession, 
um, are at risk because we believe people. Um, I don't really believe that, but I say that I've learned a little bit. I'd also say that there's a limits to transparency. And let me explain what I mean by that. What I observe about family physician leaders as they respond to crisis is that they're really good at transparency. And what I'm talking about is transactional transparency. And to give you examples in the history of this department, I'm thinking about obstetrics and the obstetric crisis from the early 2000s. I'm thinking about, uh, oh, the state legislature has cut this amount of money, that sort of thing. We're really good, by and large, across the country at, at uh, transactional transparency. That is, this is what's happened. We need to bring everybody together, tell them what's happened so we can do something about it. But that's not enough. You need to give people a vision of how you're going to get out of this. Vision is really critical. And that's my second point. Um, this graph comes, and Anne will recognize this, um, back 13, 14 years ago, we said, we need to change all of chronic disease care for all family physicians and all other primary care providers across the United States. And this is a map where we were trying to decide how we were going to spread across um, 2,000 primary care practices across the state. The point here, and this is a quote by Daniel Burnham from the Chicago area, but it's actually uh, taken from Goethe and uh, from, the, from the 1700s, is make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood. Um, make big plans, aim high in hope and work, remembering that a noble logical diagram are once reported will never die. So I would uh, encourage all of you, whether you're thinking about your uh, ward team or you're thinking about where you're gonna go in your unit or where you're gonna go at a other level is think about the vision and how you capture people. So that's, that's a motivation. I'm not talking about being realistic. Um, marijuana is not yet legal in North Carolina. <laughs> I'm talking about talking about the future and um, how it can be better than what we know. Because if we're just communicating about how bad it is, that's the way to burn out. Um, I think it's important to underscore that there are practical arts to leadership, and this is not something out of professionalism. It means being organized. Uh, for me, the best example of it is um, what you need to do when you're taking care of a complex patient in the inpatient service. You have to manage eight, 10, 12 problems. You have to prioritize on it, but you gotta keep it on the problem list because you never know when that calcium that was a little bit high is gonna reach up and bite you. Um, it's that kind of organization and, and being persistent. Um, I would say, and there are many experts in legislation, but um, I think um, you go to the legislature, there are things you wanna do, you don't get what you want, you maybe get nothing, but if you stop going, you fail and you make progress over time with that. And then finally, passing it on. Um, uh, what, you know, bright people are a dime a dozen. Brilliant ideas are maybe $10 a dozen, but uh, actually sustaining those and putting it into place is really, really hard. And that's uh, through working with relationships, that's through changing systems, that's through changing culture. And I'd suggest that a key part of it is teaching. Now, it's no accident that the etymology of doctor is teacher, right? We teach our patients, we teach colleagues, we teach and educate throughout that. That's a core part of professionalism, which drives us going farther. So I'd, 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 I'd end with a comment about how passing it on is really critical. And so going back to that medical student, um, I'd say, look, professionalism is the foundation of our work. And it's in a very chaotic world, it's our hope for meaning and, uh, and durability. And that the elements that I'd emphasize is respect for everyone, commitment to actually keep on doing it better, and then advocacy, and that those are the springboard for leadership moving forward. Um, I'd say that our contract with society demands nothing less from us. So with that, let me say thank you. Um,
And this is obviously a significant moment for me moving forward. And um, I'm indebted to Tim Dahlman in this context, who for a number of years, and we actually wrote a paper along this, has said the Catholic understanding of the development of priests is really valuable. And they use a term called formation. And what formation is, is one part curriculum, but it's mostly all the experiences that individuals have. In our setting, it means the patients we work with, the medical students and residents we work with, the colleagues, the institution, the state. All of those lead to the development of character. And that's what formation is. And in that setting, I'm deeply grateful for what everybody in the room and many others have taught me over the years. And I, uh, I greatly appreciate what you've done. So thank you all very much. And uh, let me close with comments and questions about leadership or professionalism or life. My former roommate. Warren, is it because in sharing medicine we're blessed with society to be kept medicine? American Academy of Family Physicians um, are linked with other national organizations, international organizations, Wonka, et cetera, that I'm struggling with. Do we have a problem with? So, where are we going? So, this is an awesome leadership issue. Um, we have primary, you know, health is primary. We have let's satisfy the quadruple blame. Let's talk about the patient centered medical home. And each thing is amazing. And each thing has taken thousands of people's, you know, work hours to come up with should we go this way? What's your sense of whether for family medicine, our diversity and our abilities actually sometimes subtract? From the ability to have momentum in all one thing, like the American Cat Board of uh, Pediatrics saying, this will be our one thing. Um, so, know that I am currently putting together a strategic planning process for the American Board of Family Medicine. So, this question is very <coughs> close to the top. Let me make a couple of points. I, I was fortunate to participate in the uh, future family medicine effort in the early 2000s. And the abstract of this, I remember thinking, I, I came in at the last one, was one of the readers of the final products. I wasn't one of the writers. But what it said was in the abstract, I remember being, this was very brave. They said, without dramatic change in healthcare system and dramatic change in our model of care, family medicine will be extinct in 25 years. We're now halfway through, folks. We've actually come a long way with the change in the system. You know, we all worry about what's gonna happen with that. Um, and I think as we shift over to capitation and the Academy has been very important for paper value and, and a variety of other things, we have a long way to go. We've also done a lot of work with our model of care, but I don't think anybody would say that uh, we're where we should be. I remember we had huge expectations for EHRs. They're going to be, make it so much more efficient. And quality of care is going to go up. And, you know, I think there are ways in which that's true, but the activation energy is huge. <laughs> and I think we'll eventually get to the next generation where we can get out of typing and using voice again. Uh, but that's, so that's, there are a lot of things going on. The second issue for me is that if that's the context, and, and what I would say is that, the message I get from that, Mike, is it is in our hands. What happens, whether we go extinct or whether we actually create a system that is more just with a robust primary care setting is really dependent on the people in the room and um, society going forward. So that, that's the, the, the broader issue of it. Um, the second point I'd make is that uh, th these are environments in which the change is rapid. I mean, think about what's happened in the last week. Uh, just in the last week, right? You have, um, you have 
uh, because of the ongoing, I mean, our, our political culture continues to be absolutely miserable. You have uh, the FBI raiding a doctor, at a lawyer's office. You've got Mark Zuckerberg on uh, on Hill, and one of the responses to that, which I love, which is from the Wall Street Journal, was, "Well, uh, you know, why don't we just get everybody to have control of their own information?" Right. That is, a company like Facebook would have to pay you for the use of your information. <clears throat> now, aside from the issue that that probably would take away three or four trillion dollars of national <laughs> of our national product if they did that. And so it's what we've been facing in medicine for a long time is with as a family doctor, who controls your information? Um, and then most recently, Amazon and the other things that have happened. And that's just that's just one week. So you've got a plan for uncertainty along those times. And that's one of the reasons why I'm emphasizing uh, professionalism sort of moving forward. I also think that the family of family medicine uh, can be mo more coherent and then thinking about how to do that. That's too long an answer to mine, but <laughs> or for an ex roommate, I'll do anything. Yeah. Yes, Brooke. Uh, Dr. Newton, thank you for a motivational talk. You are very, it's, it's nice to open up these problems and talk about them. I learned all that I learned in medicine, family medicine, in this institution from Ed Shahady. I mean, Ed, we put the fire in your belly. Or his boot in your ear. <laughs> <laughs> you done, and you did it with respect, and you keep talking what integrity was. And what I've learned after 40 years of private practice is that integrity is the, is the centerpiece of, of uh, what I do, and it should stay that way. What concerns me, however, is I do think family medicine will be extinct in the next several years if we don't make any changes. We look at large hospital systems consolidating and they're dismantling long-standing practices in order to do that, not for the good of the community, but for their uh, money to their procedural arm of the hospital. I mean, if you look at cardiovascular health care costs and loss of productivity being $388 billion a year or a billion dollars a day, uh, they feel that their model to capture that money is very appropriate for the community. And I venture to say that's probably not necessarily the case. Carolina's healthcare system and UMC were going to do a merger because that was going to improve the quality of health care for the state of North Carolina. Yet we don't have a true definition of what quality means. We talk about outcomes and use that term synonymously uh, in a synonymous fashion as being equal to quality, but that's never been defined as far as I know before. And so just rambling a little bit here, but I uh, just appreciate anything you have to say, or even Dr. Shahadi for that matter, because he will, he will have no problem giving his opinion. <laughs> so a couple of comments, and obviously there's a lot there to respond to. One comment is that also um, part of my motivation as a teacher came from a particular family man family meeting that Ed did when I was an intern on an inpatient service. And his dedication to teaching has been a model for me for my entire life. So I want to thank you, Ed, about that. Um, I, I think um, I think for me, where I would worry, your your comment, there's many things that I can say, and I think you're you're illustrating what the what the significant issues are. Um, Two comments historically that I'd make is that I believe that in the early 90s, most hospitals gave up their social mission. Um, I believe that GME gave up its social mission probably about the same time. And what in hospitals that translated to is we bring somebody in the hospital when they're an elderly person, they don't know what to do uh, and put them there, even if it's just to get four squares, three squares, and, uh, uh, and um, try to figure out what's going on. Um, I think GME gave uh, the, the mission, uh, gave up the, that, that social mission. If you go back to when GME was founded in the 64, 67, they said uh, GME exists to meet the needs of society, okay? Not to further the profit of the hospitals, but society. So, where I'm going with that and just give examples and these are partial solutions is that uh, through AHEC as my colleagues and Aaron Freyer is there, we sort of push the social accountability to begin to say um, in North Carolina with what AHEC can do, um, 
we will pay if you keep a, a provider here in, in the state. And ultimately, we'd like to say we will pay for your education. Since the government is paying for doctor's education, we will pay if you accept Medicaid. And we will pay if you are in, have a higher profession of your graduate. So that, that kind of accountability, you know, we worked with the National Government Association. I think that model, there's a lot of interest in that kind of model right now, but it's really trying to put teeth into GMA. An example in North Carolina, there's about $430, $440 million of uh, GME funding in the state. Um, about $100 million comes from Medicaid, but it's black box. Institutions can do whatever they want. How about accountability for that, for the needs of society? So that's, and I, and I think your point about outcomes and quality measures, when I work with clinicians, as I have over 20 years, and I'm looking at Ann and Dana and many others who've been working with that, um, the first reaction is, well, we don't know how to measure quality. In fact, we do. Uh, we've got a lot of experience with it, um, and it, it's robust uh, psychometrically. And um, that's not the issue. The issue now is that we have too many measures. Uh, IOM estimated that we have 10,000 quality measures being used in something like 26 states. I don't remember that number exactly. But uh, so what we did, and I, I chaired a task force with the IOM here, is to say, what are the measures that are most important moving forward? If we want to improve the health of the population, how do we boil that down into measures? So we went from 325 nationally accepted measures to about 26, 27 to say, all right, practices, all right, hospital, hospitals, I mean, these are what you're going to focus on. These are the ones that we care about. This is, if we do pay for performance, that's what we're going to send. So you don't have this business of uh, AQA 128 measures that you've got to track all of them in your EHR and in your, in your overworked brain. So that's where I'm going with that. And I think there's obviously a lot more to go. So I think, thank you for your question, Brooke. Artie, and then, yeah. All right, just keep on talking Turkey, Warren. Appreciate your comment about the uh, bristles that we have to be wary of. Seems to me that cost remains, unfortunately, the thing that can take us down the path. I wonder if you have a comment about how we can have conversations with our specialist colleagues. It just seems like the certainly Medicare will go broke first, I imagine. How do we figure out how to break this dollar up in a way that would be, I guess, encourage primary care to have a better place? I, I worry about not my own salary, I worry about getting primary care doctors in the future. And it seems like I wonder what you think about the, the possibilities of having conversations with our specialist colleagues about that. Yeah, and, and I, I have to tell you that one of my one of my experiences and my AA colleagues is that I talk with lots of different uh, professions and like family docs, they all say, when we get to pay for value, we're finally gonna get what we work. <laughs> uh, that's what I've heard PT say that, I've heard nurses say that, I've heard DNP say that, everybody thinks the same thing as if once manna from heaven comes, we'll be able to split it. You got to get into the actual things that happen in these large integrated systems. Um, I'll give you an example. Three years ago, it was a bad year for hospitals around the state. And instead of the three to five percent margin, they, they a number of them. A lot of it was due to epic misimplementations. Uh, but what was telling is what those hospital systems put their investment in when when. Hospital system A lost $700 million. Where did their cuts come from? And only one hospital system in the state actually said, no, we're going to take it out of cardiology and put it into primary care and, uh, and its wraparound services. That was mission, by the way. <clears throat> um, so I think you know what they do. We're, we're what these hospital systems are in, and it's perfectly rational. Right now, most of the money they're getting paid is on on the fee for service side, and it's and it's chemotherapy and it's whatnot. I mean, I, I and it's uh, dermaplast that you give people in clinic. I'm looking at Brian, and it's, it's that. <laughs> but it's you know when we were looking at, at erythropoietin here. The, the amount of money for a 15 minute shot that we could get here from Medicare was $1,500. One shot, and that was our margin. 
Who's a martyr? Not even Harry Stafford can earn that much money. <laughs> and that's appalling and immoral. And uh, I think my other fear is actually something that you've not named, is that we, I think there's a, there's a lot of money pursuing high-tech solutions to things. And, um, you know, if there's a killer app that will reduce healthcare, we'll let everybody know where they can get the MRI cheapest because they're not having to pay the, the facility fee out of her purse. And there's probably some benefit to that. But where we're going is relationship-free medicine, right? And at some point, we've got to we've got to value, we've got to put a, a figure out a way to monetize the relationship, and maybe capitation can do that. I, I, I don't know about you, but this this range of are you going to try to reform the system or be a revolutionary? I'm gradually getting more revolutionary in my old age. Um, and so I've been at the at the state level. We've got to go towards capitation. Because that's the only, for a long time, I've said, well, maybe not. You know, there's a lot of problems with that. Everything depends on what you're capitated and what the risk adjustment is. But I think the current situation is intolerable. Now, the question will be, once we capitate, how will the health systems react to that? You know, will they just cut, you know, it, everything depends on the, on the, on the, on the executive of the C-suite. But let's be clear that that's what our goal is. And, and just to, to bring bring back to circle, having family docs outside of hospitals is really a problem because it's in hospitals where you learn to work with all the other doctors. It's in hospitals where you learn to work with the administrators. And one of the things I'm really proud about this department is that our outcomes are tremendous in terms of uh, people who are still engaged in the hospital. Um, and you don't have to be seeing, I mean, I'm, I'm mindful of uh, Pat Gutierrez with his new practice. I've seen him rounding in the hospital, even though he's not paid fee for service, I've seen him rounding in the hospital multiple times taking care of his patients because he's capitated and he's taking care of his patients uh, and connecting with them. And I, there's a, a number of ways of doing that. So that's a very long answer to a simple question, so I apologize. Yeah. Um, to add something into the future, there's some movement of like CVS running with the major insurance companies to create urgent care centers, and they're stopping up a lot of primary care patients. Um, I don't know if it's a sensational paper, but it's like 25% of patients in some area are moving from primary care to urgent care centers. Um, is there space for that? And then how would that model look if you don't have a true urgent care how can you market yourself? Yeah, you know, I think that actually. For me, the, the data is still out about that. If you look at the classic one in Minnesota uh, with um, um, the Minute Clinics, what Minute Clinics did in Minnesota is basically add cost. They didn't actually change the amount of primary care visits per patient, they just added cost. Um, and now who knows what will happen as they evolve many clinics are getting into chronic disease. And, and I, know, I do that, I mean, I'm not sure where that will go. What I will say is that if you do advanced access and you bring people in, you can compete with uh, minute clinics. You've just gotta be able to do it and get people in to be seen and have a real service ethic about doing that. So I believe that you can do it. And then the benefits of being able to handle more than one thing at a time like prevention, more than one problems. I also think that there's room for disruption at the other end. I mean, so the way I see this is going in terms of scope of practice, I mean, first of all, let me be clear. I miss my patients who come in with urgent problems because my practice as my patients have gotten older, is, I mean, every patient I have is between six and 12 problems. I really like having a simple UTI every so often. <laughs> and I'll grant you that an EHR, it used to be, that would be a two minute visit in pre-EHR days. It is probably a 10 minute visit now. So I can't quite make up the time, but um, I think there's real opportunity at the other end. I mean, sort of at what point do you add to the scope of practice so that the more you do out of the hospital, you know, part of where I think Christy wants to go with urgent care, what Kaiser has begun to do on the East Coast is say, look, we need to have a place where if they go to the hospital, they go to the emergency room, they don't automatically go into the hospital. And they've set this up in a couple of cities. You know, so I'm saying, all right, can we do deliveries downstairs? Or can we, yeah. you know, do rule out MIs? Uh, 
But the point is, if they go to the emergency room, if you're over in, at UNC, if you're over 70, you've got a 75% chance of coming into the hospital if you go to the emergency room. That's a problem. And that's a huge cost. And it's only going to, you know, while we're still doing fee for service, that's what's going to go on. But if you, if you, that's why I want to go for it. Again. And what urgent care does often is fractionate care and discoordinate care, and it'll add to cost. Sir. So I've been thinking about the fund market recently with these ads with Atrium and their anesthesiology group firing and yeah. appointing physicians. Um, two questions. One would be as this landscape changes, do you think as physicians we just need to kind of um, go along with the changes and, and work to make it work to fight for the value we care about, or, or the people who are just like, digging their heels in and fighting against the corporate changes? <laughs> Are they just going to eventually lose in the way? The second thing is the way this fight is playing out, maybe other fights like uh, Wade Med UNC years ago. Do you, do you think that's damaging the public's perception of physicians and how we care for people and what can we do about it? I, I really, I think this will need to be the last question. I'm really worried about the public perception of physicians. Um, uh, a comment about, you know, Carolina's within a year. Prediction right here, April 13, is Carolinas will integrate with somebody else within a year. We were the second suitor. There'll be a third suitor because that's where it's going at the national level. Um, and there's always going to be these fights between doctors, and particularly wealthy doctors and large systems that are trying to. Uh, anesthesiology, in particular, has a very powerful business model across the state where they have essentially monopolies in counties. And they can, they're charging 300% of Medicare and CHS is like pushing back at that. But the broader issue is the perception of us. And this is a real worry. And I think it's another area where we can learn from pediatrics. What I, as I go around the state, when I have communities coming together to do something, the doctors are never there. They're only there if their money is at stake if their payment as they stay. Now, of course, the meetings are, you know, in the middle of the day when they're seeing patients, there's all sorts of things like that. But if we're perceived as we're only there when it's our money, and here's where pediatrics can teach us. If, if there's anything going on in the state with child health, the pediatricians are a part of it. How do we get involved in that? You know, Evan sent an email around opiates. You know, if, if we're not, Responding to society, we're really at risk. So I just close it with there. Thank you very much. Just a moment, we have some more recognitions um, and announcements related to you. Um, but thank you very much uh, for, it's hard to even know where where to go with that but thank you from the deepest part of our hearts for your service to this department to our discipline and just to who you are and who you continue to be as you take this next step in leadership i have a couple other announcements i'm going to keep them up here but i wanted to be sure to thank the planning committee for this event uh, we thanked um, UNC Physicians Network earlier, but I also want to um, thank several people who really worked hard to pull our alumni together and also to plan the Henley event to do this all in coordination. Specifically, I want to thank Amir Barzin, Deb Porterfield, Reed Johnson, uh, Adam Goldstein, of course, and uh, Phil Sloan, who led this event. So thank you very much, Phil. <laughs> And I'm going to call up Adam, Alfred, and Sam Weir to come present a gift to you, Warren, and a couple of announcements. So, uh, Are you nervous? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Warren, you know, um, on behalf of the uh, planning group, we wanted to um, get you something that uh, represents a value. And last year we came up with a gift and you will have your own in here, but we're learning a little bit better rather than have you unwrap it and, and uh, risk 
uh, something we, we actually have a, a picture of what it looks like. <laughs> and it's just like, pass it around, pass it around. Um, and this is a clock, as, as you can uh, see, and it has your, your name and uh, the lectureship and, and the date and the time, and it's uh, Simon Pierce. It's, it's actually a piece of, of art and a clock, and I think um, as we think about your professionals and we're have a glorious um, day, a Carolina day with a lot of Carolina alumni here to, to really celebrate uh, uh, the, the Henley family contributions and your contributions, we shouldn't forget about uh, the, the, the metaphor of, of the clock here with you. Um, we hope that when you go to your new place and it gets to be 12 o'clock that you see that as a time for lunch, not as a time in the evening to send an email. <laughs> When it's five o'clock, we hope that you see that as a time in the afternoon to go have a nice meal with Anna, rather than 5 a.m. to send another email. <laughs> um, but that the reality is that the rhythm of the clock, the ticking, the dependability um, as time moves on of the relationships that you so articulated today is one that we really wanted to celebrate and just say thank you. I go way back. Um, probably a few of you know that in the uh, fall of 1983, uh, a, a younger Dr. Newton and a, and a younger Sam Weir were um, uh, interviewing for residencies and interviewing residency applicants, uh, respectively. And um, I remember very clearly my interaction with Warren as a prospective uh, intern to this program and going immediately to the associate residency director's office afterwards and saying, we got to get him. We got to get this guy. Um, and uh, that, that really was my first interaction with Warren, that we were residents together. We were fellows together. We were junior faculty together. I took a few years off, but then I came back and, and we really enjoyed, I think, careers together. Um, one of the things that uh, Warren helped lead and, and, and I participated some in was uh, the development of, before there was evidence-based medicine, of critical appraisal rounds. And the story goes that after the first year or so of doing this, that, that um, you know, Warren thought we should celebrate the best presentations at critical appraisal rounds each year. And I, I don't know if it's true or not, but my memory is that you went to the trophy shop and asked them what was the cheapest trophies. That they had. <laughs> and they said they had these frogs. And, um, and so, um, and so uh, Warren developed the, the, what I think were for a year or two the Frog Awards, but then became the Kermits. And so uh, Warren, on, on behalf of, of all of us uh, who have perhaps received Kermits or Frogs over the years, this is a Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, the Frog Award for you to disclose. <laughs> <laughs> rather formal uh, for, for, for you to uh, for my office for, for your office in <laughs> so, so you can remember your amphibious roots started. Do you? I captured a bullfrog for Helen when she was a little girl. I brought a giant bullfrog in a jar yes. for her and gave, gave a bullfrog to Helen. For her so pet. And then it became a prestigious frog. <laughs> that's good. That's that's good. Good. I, I, I got that. That's good. So to um, almost close. Um, I, I just like to say I've known Warren since he was a senior resident. That's about the time I joined the department. Um, and I can simply say thank you. But I'd like to take a, just a moment of your time uh, to uh, announce an effort that Adam Goldstein and Brad Wilson, our development director, uh, and I have, uh, have undertaken uh, with the, with, in coordination with the department's executive committee and, and partners throughout the state 
um, to establish uh, an endowment uh, in Warren's name. Uh, we know, we've seen uh, already earlier today uh, that mentoring uh, and particularly its effect on leadership uh, have been uh, guiding principles uh, for Warren. Um, and it's certainly uh, your presence uh, here today is a, uh, is a tribute to that as, as well. And so we think an endowment uh, to promote mentorship for students, residents, and especially for faculty uh, would be an entirely appropriate way uh, to honor and to sustain uh, Warren's legacy here at UNC. Um, now, over the last several weeks, um, Adam, Brad, and I have reached out to colleagues here and, and across the state um, in an effort to bring together the critical mass of funding uh, that will guarantee a, a successful uh, launch to the, uh, to the endowment. Um, and as of today, uh, we have contributions from 53 individuals uh, totaling over $63,000. Um, we will continue this inaugural effort uh, for the next two months. Uh, and if any of you uh, feel moved to participate in that, um, Adam or Brad or I would be uh, delighted to talk with you uh, later today or indeed anytime uh, during, the, uh, during this weekend. So again, Warren, thank you. Thank you all. Dr. Lee will also be recognized tonight by our School of Medicine uh, with a very prestigious Medical Alumni Distinguished Faculty Award. And so for those of you who are, um, are part of the Alumni Weekend event, I wanted to be sure that you know um, I'll be accompanying him and Anna to that event tonight where he'll be recognized, but we will come to the cocktail right at 530 for the first part before we have to exit to that dinner. So we're looking forward to engaging with all of you. And with that, we'll take a 15 minute break and um, share and be together and then we'll come back in this room for our CME, CME activity. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.